Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at types of phagocytes, mechanisms of phagocytosis, phagocyte specializations, and then we'll finish with a summary. So some of the cells found in the body as part of the immune system can engulf and digest pathogens to stop them from causing damage. So what these cells do is that they encounter a pathogen and the cell literally just kind of overfills the pathogen and engulfs it, bringing it into the cell's contents and breaking it down. And the process of doing this is called phagocytosis, and any cell that does this can be called a phagocyte. The most well-known examples of phagocytes include macrophages and neutrophils. Macrophages have this kind of appearance, they're very large cells, and neutrophils have another type of appearance, which are a bit smaller but they have this kind of multi-lobed nucleus. Monocytes are a different cell, but they're the precursor to macrophages. So a monocyte is basically a macrophage which hasn't become a macrophage yet. So the macrophage is almost the mature form of a monocyte. So if you see these two cells mentioned, they're basically the same, they're just at different stages in their life. So the monocytes and the neutrophils are both made in the bone marrow. And remember, the bone marrow is basically the soft tissue found inside long bones, like the leg bones or arm bones. And it's where we make red and white blood cells before they enter the circulation. The monocytes circulate in the blood and eventually they'll enter the tissues which need their help. And this is where they become the macrophages. So monocytes circulate in the blood in their monocyte form. And eventually if a pathogen turns up at a particular tissue, they get recruited into the tissue, at which point they undergo a few changes and then we can name them as macrophages. So they're the same thing, but at different stages of their life. If a pathogen has infected a tissue, it needs to be dealt with. The neutrophils arrive first, and each of these neutrophils can engulf about 5 to 20 pathogenic cells. So say we have a bacterial infection. The bacteria have entered a particular tissue and they're dividing. So each one of these is a bacterial cell. The first thing that happens is neutrophils come along. They leave the blood system and they enter the tissue and they use phagocytosis to engulf about 5 to 20 of these pathogens. So each of these will be engulfed into the neutrophil's body and essentially broken down. The neutrophils don't last very long though. They die quickly after a few days, but the macrophages which have come along are very long-lived cells. So neutrophils last about 5 days. Macrophages can last 2 or 3 months. So these are the short-lived first response, macrophages last longer. When the neutrophils die, the macrophages then arrive and they sort of take over. They arrive at the infected tissue and each macrophage can engulf about 100 pathogenic cells. So the neutrophils have started to clear it up already, but they've started dying very early on. So macrophages come along and they engulf about 100 pathogenic cells. This is because they're much larger and they have a greater capacity. So we need to discuss how phagocytosis actually happens. During the process of phagocytosis, the phagocyte first recognizes a foreign marker on the pathogen's outer membrane, and we call this marker the antigen. So our own cells have antigens on them, but the immune system recognizes that they are our own antigens, so they're self-antigens. On a pathogen, like a bacterial cell, they have a cell membrane, and embedded in that cell membrane are particular proteins. These are antigens, and they're recognized as being non-self, or foreign. So the phagocyte cells come across these antigens and they recognize that they're not one of ours, so they recognize that it's a foreign marker. At this point, small nonspecific protein molecules, called opsonins, attach to these antigens. So we have opsonin molecules, which bind to the antigen because they have a specific binding complementary shape. So they attach to the antigen at various points on the pathogen. When the opsonin is bound to the pathogen, the phagocyte is allowed to bind to the opsonin, which has been attached. This allows the phagocyte to get very close to the pathogen, so it can start carrying out phagocytosis. So we've got the pathogen, we've got these opsonin molecules bound to those antigens, and the phagocyte recognizes that the opsonins are preoccupied in binding to something. So it's a kind of opsonin receptor. Usually the opsonins are just floating around, not really bound to anything. But if the opsonins bind to the pathogen, they sort of cluster together, and the phagocyte will recognize that they're attacking something, and therefore there's a problem. So the phagocyte can then become close in contact with the pathogen. It's at this point that the pathogen is then engulfed into the phagocyte. It gets enclosed into a large vacuole, or a space inside the cell, and that vacuole is called a phagosome. 
So here's the pathogen here, and you can see that the phagocyte kind of wraps some cell cytoplasm around the pathogen. And over time, it will enclose the pathogen and keep it into a vacuole called the phagosome. So the pathogen is now inside the cell cytoplasm in this vacuole space. Now we need to begin destroying the pathogen. So the phagosome fuses with lysosomes, and the lysosomes are contained waiting in the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. A lysosome is a vesicle which contains digestive enzymes called lysozymes. So here we have these lysosomes. It's important you don't get the words mixed up here. The lysosome is the vesicle, which is a membrane-bound vesicle, and inside those vesicles are digestive enzymes. And those digestive enzymes are called lysozyme. So the purpose of these enzymes is that when they fuse with this phagosome, the enzymes get released onto the pathogen and they can start breaking it down. So the fusion causes the lysozymes to be released into the phagosome and they break down the pathogen's structure. There are some special cells like macrophages which do not completely destroy the pathogen and they save some of the pathogen's antigen. So at this point, most of the pathogen's been broken down, so the harm that it can do is now lost, but they keep the antigen in its natural structure. And what the cells do with this antigen is they put the pathogen's antigen onto a special protein complex, so they join it to this special protein, and then they move it to the cell surface membrane. So they're presenting the antigen to other cells, and other immune cells can recognize the pathogen's antigen. So it's kind of waving a flag saying that I've eaten a pathogen, and this is the antigen that it has. You need to be aware of this antigen. So the protein complex is put into the membrane, and the antigen faces away from the cell towards other cells. So macrophages and other special cells which are able to do this are what we call antigen-presenting cells, because they are simply presenting the antigen to other cells. In order for a phagocyte to be able to do all of these things, it has to be specialised to carry out each step in phagocytosis. We know that in tissues of the body, cells tend to be specialised with various different things, so that they can carry out their function. And the specialisations we're going to be talking about are the nucleus, which has an unusual shape, mitochondria, lysosomes, and the cytoskeleton. So one of the adaptations is that the phagocytes have a well-developed cytoskeleton. And remember, the cytoskeleton is basically the skeleton of the cell. It's lots of different fibres and filaments running across the cell in various directions. The reason it has this is that it helps them to change shape so that they can engulf pathogens and move lysosomes around. So remember, in order to get that pathogen, say for example if it was here, it needs to be able to move its cytoplasm and membrane into various complicated shapes. So having a dense cytoskeletal network helps them to do this, as it can move the membrane into lots of shapes. And also, it's not just for maintaining shape, but lysosome vesicles move around the cell on these fibres as a kind of traffic network. So this means the lysosomes can be sent anywhere around the cell to where the pathogen is being engulfed. They also have many mitochondria in their cells which release energy, and this is useful because the cell movement and the process of phagocytosis uses lots of energy. So the more mitochondria we have, the more ATP the cell can produce. They also have lots of ribosomes. Ribosomes are involved in protein manufacture, and the purpose of this is to synthesize the lysosome's enzymes, those lysozyme enzymes. So here's the ribosome, and of course ribosomes read mRNA as a long strand of nucleotides, and then from this they'll produce all of those lysozyme enzymes that go into lysosomes. So there's plenty of enzymes to help break down the pathogens. Phagocytes have a lobed nucleus, so lobed basically means it's sort of broken up into different points, although they're slightly connected. The reason for this is it helps the cell squeeze through narrow gaps between the cells and the tissues. So sometimes the phagocyte might be in a tissue which has very highly organised cells, like in the skin. So there's not many spaces for it to move around. And the cell has to be able to squeeze between gaps to arrive at where the pathogen is. So having a lobed nucleus... For example, here we can see two distinct lobes, one here and one here. This allows it to change shape and squeeze into narrow gaps. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.